flames in your eyes You got wonder working power pouring out of your side Take the tomb all the way through the grave was empty inside Ain't no other pull the greatest miracle of all time You got power demons cower when they hear your name called You got power that's the towers make a lion look small You got power to devour any counterfeit roll Even your tongue is a sword, kind of the score You are the Lord You never see me wrong. 
Welcome to Simple Church this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, a few weeks ago, we kicked off this series that we were calling Let's Grow Up. And we've been talking about these Christ-like traits that Jesus said that he wanted his followers to produce or that he wanted his followers to live out. Um, we learned something interesting the first week, and that is that Jesus never said he wanted his followers to be spiritual. There's like no place in scripture, not one place where Jesus calls people to be quote unquote spiritual. He says he wants them to mature. He wants them to live out these virtues, these fruits of the spirit. It's interesting because that song we were singing about walking with Jesus, that that's what Jesus calls us to do. He calls us to walk with him, but, but here's the deal. He calls us to walk with him. You understand that? Like he, he's saying, I want you to walk with me. He's not saying, I want to walk with you and I want to just go where you, I want you to walk with me. I want you to go where I go. I want you to act like I act. I want you to react like I reacted. This is, this is so deep what we've been talking about. And Kevin and I were talking at staff meeting last week and, and I said, are, are we doing good at communicating how important this is? Like, are, are we doing good at, at letting people know how deep this is, how important this is? I mean, this is so huge. Uh, Becky said yesterday, we were talking about today, and she's like, are you guys still on Let's Grow Up? And I said, yeah. And she goes, how long do you think you'll be on it? And I go, till we grow up. I mean, growing up takes time, right? We may be on this series until Jesus comes, all right? Some of you may, you may check out during this series. This is how important this is. Let's grow up. Let's live out these virtues. Here's what these virtues are if you forgot. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The way people see if we're living these attributes out is by watching us and seeing how we act and how we react toward them and others. That, that's how people know. The only, the only evidence of us living like this is how we act and how we react. Jesus said that these are the very attributes and values of God. And by you and I living these attributes and these values out, the world gets to see what God's like. So here's the reality that hit me this week. If we're presenting to the world anything other than these virtues, we're bearing false witness. We are. I mean, we're, 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 we're doing this wrong. We're, we're, we're messing up. Today, we're going to talk about this virtue of forbearance. And, and in most translations that you read nowadays, it's kind of defined out as patience. That's what that means. So I want to kick off this morning with a question. Where, when, or with whom do you tend to have a short fuse? You don't have to answer this out loud. And if your husband or wife just elbowed you, they think it's you. Okay, I'll help you out, all right? Because you may, you may be clueless. Where, when, or with whom do you tend to have a short fuse? 
For some of you today, the answer might be work, where you work. That might be the place, the where, where your fuse is short, where somebody does something you don't like and you're just ready to go, where you walk in in the morning hoping you don't see him or see her, and if you do, you start in. For some of you, the when, when you have the short fuse. Uh, for some of you, it's maybe when you're trying to get something done or you're working on a deadline and you're running out of time and you get very antsy, you get very, very anxious, you get very bothered. For some of you, the whom is it that you have the short fuse with? For some of you, maybe like me, if you're honest, it's your family. I mean, Becky and I were talking about this, and I think for me and for Becky and for all three of our boys, the answer for us, for the whom, it's each other. It's our family. And isn't that crazy how so many of us, it's the ones that we say we love the most that we lose it the most with. And then you know what happens? If you're like me, we make up this mistake. Well, that's just because we know each other so well. That's because we spend so much time together. That's because we can be our true selves together. That's a bunch of bull. And you can finish that out with whatever word you want after bull, okay? Because that's what it is. And hopefully for you, it was just bull, bull, okay? If it wasn't, watch out. But it is. Like, we say that. Becky and I got married when we were 18 years old, and for the first 20 years of our marriage, I used that as an excuse about how I acted and reacted. I would say, I remember my mom one day saying, don't talk to your wife like that. And I said, well, you know, we got married so young, and we kind of grew up together, and she looked at me and went, that's the problem. You didn't grow up, boy. And I was like, okay, well, you're going to argue with your mom? I still won't argue with my mother, all right? She can still smack me, all right? It's amazing how long that arm can get. And it's like, well, you're just going, it's, it's our family that, that we lose it the most with. I guess another way we could have asked the question is this, where, when, or with whom do we tend to lose our patience? I mean, I can't tell you the only way I know how to be. It's like the older you get in life, you realize honesty is the best, right? You realize it's the best policy. You, some of us even look back and go, man, wish I would have been transparent and honest years ago. But for, for us and our family, I can't tell you how many times my kids would look at me in our house when I said something or did something and, and they would go, I wish the whole church was here right now. And one time I looked back at my son and went, what's that supposed to mean? He goes, because you never say that at church. You never act like that at church. Somebody at church can be there, or you can be at church, or you can be with a group of people from church, and you would never react like that. But when we're here, and it took about 3,000 times of them saying that to me before one day I woke up and went, what is that? Well, it's immaturity is what that is. It's 100% what that is. Every single one of us in here today, we have a story of when we lost it, don't we? And some of us have more than just a story. Some of us have a story book of when we've lost it, of the times that we ran out of patience. And we all have a place that our fuse tends to be shorter than normal. And all of us have a person or a people that when we're around, our fuse is shorter than normal. In the Greek language, when they spoke of patience, this is honestly how it could be defined, to have a long fuse. When, when Paul, when they wrote this in Scripture and said, be patient, what they were saying was, have a long fuse. Refrain from having action toward another. It's referring to both inner and outward patience toward anyone who's on the other side of us. I want you to hear that again. When the Bible speaks of patience... It's talking about and referring to both an inner and an outward patience toward anyone who is on the other side of us. And you know who we have the most trouble being patient with? Anyone who's on the other side of us. Why? Because they're on the other side of us. We could say it's not just about having patience at the store while you're waiting in a long line. It's also and more so about having patience with the person who got in the line and made it longer. Last week, I was at the store 
um, at the mall, I was getting a, a, a shirt, and I, I used to enjoy going to the mall and stores, and, 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 and I don't anymore. And I was in this long line of people, and this particular store, the way they had it set up, it was kind of hard to tell where the line really started. And, and I was probably seven or eight, maybe nine people deep in line, and there was a large gap before you could get to the register. And there was an elderly guy that was walking along, and all of a sudden, the, the, the cashier's moving real slow. All of a sudden, he just like cuts in the line, and, and was this guy, move, he just cuts in and goes up to the line, and you can imagine just the, the, the tension that all of a sudden, because we've all been waiting there, so everybody's antsy, some people are saying things, and, and, and you're just, you're so frustrated, you're so angry toward that person. And the cashier is trying to explain to him what's going on, that he just cut in front of the, everybody else in line. And, and, and everybody's just, I mean, people are saying stuff they shouldn't say. And then another guy comes up and he's tapping him on the shoulder. And, and you can see that the guy that's walked in front of everybody is distraught. He doesn't really, I don't think he really knew that he cut in front of everybody. And finally, after being heckled for five or 10 minutes, he turned around and he looked at the line and he said, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I was supposed to go back there. I'm on the way to my wife's funeral, and I didn't have a shirt that fit. And I'm thinking, this is one of those times that I'm glad I kept my mouth shut. This is one of those times that I'm so glad I just bit my tongue. But I was still thinking things. Like, what's this guy doing? Nobody had time to hear his story. And I wonder how many times in life we just don't have time to hear somebody's story. We're just not patient enough. Th th that type of patience, is it's unnatural. And the degree to which God expects us to act and react with this type of patience is impossible. I mean, it's 100% impossible for you and I, at least on our own, to react with and act with this type of patience all the time. But Paul says if we lean into and depend on the Spirit of God within us, the Holy Spirit, if we pause and ask for help, that the Spirit comes in and helps us. I want you to look at something else Paul, Paul wrote to this group of people that were trying to follow Jesus, trying to walk with Jesus. He says this to them, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Paul's with this group of people, a group of people that he had previously been talking about these fruits, these virtues, these characteristics of the Spirit, and how important it was to live them out. And then he writes this, that, that you should warn those who are idle and disruptive. He says those, those people who don't like authority, those people who don't want to contribute to a cause, who just, they, they want to always talk about the problem, but they don't want to work toward a solution. The, the people that just cause problems, he says, listen, I, I want you to warn them. Now, I want you to notice something that he didn't say. He didn't say, I want you to condemn them. He didn't say, I want you to publicly shame them. He didn't say, I want you to post nasty stuff about them. He didn't say, I want you to write stuff bad about them. He says, warn them. But so many times in the last few weeks, you've heard us say, when you are reading scripture, you are accountable to study some things out. It's not good enough to just read things. You have to look. And when you study scripture out and you look at the Greek and the Hebrew, sometimes we find out it means something that we didn't think it did. In this instance, when Paul says warn them, warn means to give friendly advice and to give friendly counsel. That's what it means. Paul says these people who are idle, these people who, who are, are just always causing trouble, these people who are disrespective, he says, listen, I want you to warn them. I want you to give them friendly advice and counsel. In other words, he's saying you should care enough about them just because they're a human being that you should warn them, give them friendly advice, give them friendly counsel. Then he says this, encourage the disheartened, the people who are losing hope or the people who have lost hope, the people who want to give up, the people who need more attention. Anybody in here have someone, and don't, please don't raise your hand, okay? Because we're all tempted to. We're, most of us will raise both hands. How many people in here have someone in your life that they just need attention? All the time. It's like a little puppy dog. And if you're honest with yourself and others, it drains you, right? This is one of those people that, that, that Paul said, hey, encourage them. 
build them up. How much? Over and over and over again. No matter how they lost their hope, give them hope again. No matter if the reason they've lost hope was because of a self-induced thing, give them hope again. Then he says this, help the weak. Weak meaning those who aren't where you are. Those who don't have what you have. Those who don't have access to the resources that you have. Help them and assist them. Don't see them as a burden. Help them. And here's what's interesting. When you look through this verse and do these writings of Paul and these letters, when Paul says to help someone, to carry someone's burden, to walk with them, as you study it out, you find this, that Paul's saying, I want you to help them, and he learned this from Jesus, I want you to help them at their pace. I want you to help them and walk with them at their pace. I don't know about you, but man, that's tough for me. I, Becky and I have been trying to go on, on walks. Becky has been doing very good. I think I've only gone twice in the last like three months. But the other day we were walking and she said, can you just slow down? And I'm like, I thought we were doing this for exercise. No, you step it up. And she's like, my gosh, you know, my legs are about 30 inches shorter than yours. Can you just, can you, can you just walk slower? And then instead of just slowing down, you know what I did? I went, okay. <sighs> I was grunting. I was making noise. People were out in their yards mowing, playing with their kids, looking. I'm hunched over like I just got beat up going. And I do this for like a block and a half before Becky looks at me and she, goes, she stopped and she went, why? I went, why? Why what? And she goes, why, why the show? What is so hard about just slowing down? And I go, I just, I don't want to slow down. And she's like, really? Does it always have to be about you? And inside there was little, this little voice saying, yes. Most of the time, yes. It was, it was like when you have the little angel, you see in the cartoon sitting over here going, admit it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the little devil's over here going, no, 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 lie. Don't admit it. Don't say it. It was such a hard thing for me to slow down. And to walk at her pace. I remember when my grandmother started getting older and uh, we were going to this big event. And my dad, I remember watching my dad with his mom and we were going through this crowd and he was just walking. I guess that's where I got it from, 100 miles per hour. And my grandma is just like hanging on for dear life. And she's like, I can't walk this pace. You have to slow down. I, I, I appreciate you helping me, but you have to slow down. And I remember this light bulb like just in my dad's face and eyes just went off. And he's like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe I'm doing that. Some of us, we, we just don't even realize we're doing it. Paul says, slow down. Walk at their pace. And then if that's not enough after Paul's told us all this stuff, give friendly advice, give friendly counsel, encourage people, lift people up over and over again. Don't treat them like they're a burden. Slow down. Walk with them. Help them at their pace. Then he ends it with, and while you're doing all that, be patient. <laughs> if you're like me, you're like, Paul, seriously? And if that's not taxing enough, look what he writes next. He says, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. What he's saying is don't pay back wrong with wrong. Pay back wrong with patience. That's a new one, right? Pay back wrong with patience. He said in that verse, do this and do good for each other, for those in your family, in the family of faith. But then he adds, and do good for everyone else too. Everyone else too. No matter who it is, no matter what they believe, no matter how they dress. This is a tough one for, for some folks. And if it's for you, I hope you get this today and get over it. No matter how they vote, I'm going to say that again, no matter how they vote. See, this isn't about being right and wrong. This is about our response as a Christ follower. This is about our reaction as a Christ follower. Patience should be both our response and our reaction to the unbearable, the unchangeable, the unforgivable. Scripture says, be patient. This is a newsflash for all of us. We are not called to be the administer of what we define as justice. That has never been in our role. God never put that there. You and I aren't tasked with changing anyone. 
I mean, my gosh, some of us just need to stop and admit it. We can't change people. Our responsibility as a follower of Jesus is be patient. And we all have the capacity to do that. You don't have to change people. You have to be patient with people. And listen, it's not a valid excuse to just say, you don't get, I am all out of patience. I have run out of patience. I have hit my limit with patience. If you are a parent here today and you have a child that is over, let's say, three days old, um, you have probably said this a thousand times. I'm running out of patience. I am running out of patience. You're on thin ice, buster. I can't tell you how many times growing up, we had three boys, and I cannot tell you how many times I looked at them and went, hey, the, the patience is gone. It isn't running out. It ran out like six miles ago. It's gone. There is no more left. I've hit my max. But according to Scripture, when we're feeling that way, that's time Paul says to hit pause and say, God, help me. Holy Spirit, empower me with the patience I need. And if you want to know how to increase your capacity for patience or how to lengthen your fuse, this is how it starts. This is how we start this process, by reminding ourselves of the supernatural patience God has extended toward us. Man, if we would daily remind ourselves of the patience that's been extended toward us, the supernatural patience, man, that has helped me so much to just stop and go, okay, I'm about to run out with this person. I'm about to run out here. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting my limit. And it's like, how much patience has God, I was going to say wasted, because sometimes I feel like that he has wasted some patience. But how many times has he extended patience to me? Listen, you have to remain aware of the patience God has and continues to extend toward you. The Apostle Paul in his letter to, in 1 Timothy said, I just remind myself that God has been so patient to me. And not only has he been so patient with me, he has trusted me and entrusted me to spread his message of love, regardless of all my faults, regardless of all my shortcomings, regardless of all my sin, he's entrusted me. And I want you to understand something about being a Christ follower. It's not about just getting a free ticket into heaven. When you become a Christ follower, God is entrusting you with that same message, the message of the gospel of Jesus, his son. Because you and I, when we choose to be a follower of Christ, we become a steward of the gospel in this world, in this generation. And how crazy is that? That is why these fruits of the spirit are so vitally important because they all lead back to love. And according to scripture, Love is the only way that someone knows that you are a true Jesus follower. It's not about how you vote. It's not about what you drive. Okay, it's, it's not about what you profess to believe. It is not about how many scriptures you have memorized. It's not about how quote unquote spiritual you can talk because God never said anything about being spiritual anyway, so we need to move past that. He said it's by your love. And all these virtues, these, these fruits, these characteristics, these attributes of the Spirit, they're what all lead back to love. That's what shows people what God is really like. As a Christ follower, the patience that you and I extend or withhold from someone, that is a direct reflection to them of God's love. You ever think about that? The love and patience that you and I display or the lack of love and patience we display to the outsider looking in, that's a reflection of God. That's a representation of God. And, and so that begs the question, how are we representing Jesus? How are we representing his love? We, we have to give a correct reflection. We owe it to people who are looking to give a true, real reflection of Jesus, which is, is patience. Our patience is one of the greatest reflections of God's love that we can show our world. When you think about that question that we posed last week, what does the world need right now? What does the world need more than ever? We all have all these answers, but I think really the truth is they need Jesus more than ever. And you know how they get to see Jesus? Through people who claim to follow him. Our patience, one of the greatest reflections of God's love. In 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, we all like the love chapter. We've probably all heard of the love chapter. 
And do you know the very first thing that the love chapter says when it says, this is love? The writer's explaining and defining love. And here's how he starts. Love is patient. It's the very first thing. It's not something he worked up to or used these different words. to. It, he, he kicks it off. Love is patient. The more you become and remain aware of the patience God has extended to you, the more the fruit of patience will begin to cultivate in your life and begin to grow. The Spirit will cultivate it in you, and your capacity for patience, it'll increase, and your fuse gets longer. I want to tell you something about patient people. Patient people are quick to listen, and they are slow to speak. Ask yourself, how am I doing on that one? I mean, ask yourself, because if, if we're going to be really honest, most of us, when someone starts talking to us, you know what most of us start thinking right away? What we're going to say, how we're going to answer it, or how we're going to top it, or how, how, what's going to come out of our mouth. Patient people are quick to listen, to process things. I had a supervisor at one of the jobs that I worked at, and when I first started working there, um, I could not stand her as a supervisor. I mean, she just, she just bugged me. And one of the things that bothered me the most is when I would go into her office and talk to her, she would, would sit there, and she would always look me right in the eyes. And it was like, I always felt like she was looking into my soul. And I'm like, it's okay to glance around the room. I don't think that's rude. And she would just lock in right in my eyes. And, and I, I would ask a question or say, this is what I'm going through. Or this is what I'm feeling. Or here's what I'm thinking. And she would look right at me. And I would get done with what I was asking for or presenting or talking about. And there would be this awkward, like 25, 30 second pause or she'd always lean back. This is back in the day, you know, then the boss always sat behind the desk. Not now we got to come out front and, and, and hold hands and stuff. But anyway, she, you know, she would sit behind the desk and she would always cross her arms and she would lean back in her chair and it would do that, you know, the old office chair, squeaking back. And every once in a while I would think, I hope that thing falls over. Um, and you thought this about a boss sometime too, so don't judge me, okay? So she would lean back and, and, and she would just sit there and she would stare up in the sky for like 25 or 30 seconds. And I would be like, did she, did she hear me? And then she would always, every time go, okay, here's what I'm hearing. And I'm like, oh, here we go. And she would say it. And sometimes it was exactly what I was trying to communicate, and other times it wasn't. And I would be, no, 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 here's, here's what I meant. And she'd go, okay. And then she'd pause again. And it would just be awkward. And then she would start answering or start helping me work through it or come out with a solution. After working for her for a few years and being someone that irritated me and bothered me, she is my most favorite supervisor I've ever worked for in my life because she was always quick to listen and she was slow to speak. She was patient. Patient people are honest. Patient people are honest and they speak the truth. But do you know how they speak the truth? They speak the truth in love. Growing up, I grew up in a very honest family. A good name was very important to our family. We were like third generation in our little bitty town, and, and, and it got preached to us all the time. What you do and say in school, and what you do and say on the baseball field, and what you do and say on the basketball court, it's representing our family, and our family's been here for X amount of years, and we used to walk to school uphill both ways, in the snow, no shoes, you know the story, right? And it was always, okay, and, and we are an honest family. And you know what I grew to learn about our honest family? Our honest family spoke the truth a lot. They didn't always speak it in love. They spoke the truth. But a patient person doesn't just speak the truth. They speak it in love. I think that's why to this day I'm still so fond of my grandmother. She could tell me how I was doing something wrong or how I had a bad attitude, and she could shred me up one side and down the other, and she did it in love. And when she was done, you, just, you were like, I'm guilty, and I want to get better. And my mom and dad, especially my dad, he could say the similar thing, and I was scared of him because he was very militant and very a matter of fact, and here's the way it's going to be, and he could say it, and it just it did, did not come out the right way. Patient people. This is a great one. Patient people are not the keyboard warriors. 
that are putting hateful comments online in the name of Jesus. I, I don't, do you know that's not helpful? Like, I, I just like, I would love to just, Kevin and I were talking about this the other day. I'd love to create a whole page and just say, Jesus followers only, look at this. Keyboard warriors putting hateful comments online in the name of Jesus. Not only is it stupid and ignorant, it's not helpful. It's not doing anything. I mean, come on. When is the last time that helped you when somebody wasn't patient with you? Becky and I had to pick up our son and daughter-in-law and grandkids and, and, and my, my daughter-in-law's brother and mom at the airport yesterday. And, and there wasn't enough room in, in one vehicle. So we had two vehicles and, and they've been gone for a week. So we were like, you know what? We don't want them to have to just like, drive us back to our house. So we're going to take one of our vehicles to the airport and we're going to park it in the $5,000 a minute airport parking. You guys been there, haven't you? Yeah, I'm like, Becky, we're going to sell kidneys, but we're going to park our vehicle there. We're going to park that there. And then I'm going to run out. And Becky, you go to where, where everybody, the arrival pickup is. You just, just give me like a couple minutes. I'll get in the garage park. I'll run out. I'll jump in and with you. And then we'll go back home and we'll get their other car. And then we'll come back, put their two cars right there and arrival. When they walk out, they jump in, we go and get, and, and we had a great plan, but you know what I didn't factor in? There were 5,000 other people at Lambert airport yesterday. And you know what? They all had a similar plan. There was a lot of horn honking. There was a lot of name calling. A lot of people doing Jesus' number one signal. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm like, why is everybody pointing at us with that finger? And it's like, we're, we're trying to do this really, really quick. And, and I'm going, we can get this done. We can get this done. And, and I pull in and I park and I'm running out to get to where Becky's at. And it's just a dead standstill. And I'm like, great. And then right before I got to her vehicle, I'm like, just don't, don't park. Just stay right there. You don't even have to come to a complete stop. It's like, I can jump in. Trust me. Watch, watch this. You just, as long as you're going under 20 miles per hour, I feel safe. So Becky's just kind of creeping along and I'm getting over there to get in. And, 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 and then it stops again. I'm like, good. And right when I reach for the door, the traffic breaks and Becky doesn't want to hold it up. So she starts going forward a little bit. And the guy behind us just starts blasting the horn. I mean, he's blasting the horn. And he rolls down the window and he's saying things to me. I, I know he was in the Navy. I can tell you by what he was saying to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, sorry, Navy guys, right? All the Marines. Huh? And so I was like, I go, I go, oh my gosh. And so when we got up front, he passed us up and honest to goodness, the sticker on his church said, the sticker on his car said, follow me. And it had the name of his church. Follow me to here. And, and I looked at Becky and went, that's why we're getting t-shirts and not bumper stickers at Simple Church. All right. And it's not because of you, it's because of me. All right. It's because of the people that might follow me or be behind me. All right. And I looked at Becky and I'm like, the, you know, the whole thing, I, we were trying to keep things going. And I, I was trying to make it good for everybody, not just me. We had everybody in mind. And when that horn started honking, and that language started coming out toward me. Do you think I just automatically had good thoughts and was like, oh, sorry, sir. I'm so sorry. I got in the car. And I took the mirror and Becky's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I want him to see me staring at him. And Becky goes, oh, are you, are you serious? I'm like, look, he doesn't look big. Look at the little man. He got little man syndrome. That's what he got. He got like four feet, two inches tall. I can't help it. You need to argue with God. He created you, not me. And Becky's looking at me going, are you serious? We're just leaving. That's how we instigate things with other people. If, if he would have just tooted the horn once, seriously, I think the thought that would have came to my mind was, man, I'm sorry, I'm trying to hurry up. We don't want to slow anybody down. We all want to get on going with our day. Patient people do things that are helpful. Patient people respond rather than react, and they respond with patience and love. Patient people slow down enough to let the Spirit of God move in them and through them. You know, that's one of the toughest things for us Americans, especially us American Christians, to just slow down, to slow down enough to let the Spirit of God move in us and move through us. You got to slow down because remember, God's inviting us to walk with him. He's not saying, hey, you keep going and doing your thing and your agenda and your pace and I'll just join in. When Jesus was young, Scripture described it as he was always trying to figure out what the Father was doing so he could join in, walk in rhythm with, walk in sync with, stop and smell the roses, right? 
Yesterday when we got back to the airport to pick everybody up, we parked the two vehicles. And you all, man, come on, get in. People around here are angry, nasty, they're mean, they say weird things. So just we parked and everybody's getting in and, and throwing luggage in and, and trying to get. And as soon as I get out of the truck, here's our, our little grandson, Rhett, yells Papa, and he comes running over and grabs a hold of me. And here's my son. He's got 13 suitcases in this hand, five, five backpacks over here, a playpen, all the stuff that they bought that they don't need when they were there. His wife's got a full thing. And Rhett grabs a hold of me and says, oh, Papa, and I picked him up, and about two minutes later, Becky's like, uh, it might help if you start loading the car. And I went, probably not going to happen. Probably, it's probably not going to happen, because I'm just going to stand here, and I'm just going to hug this kid and love this kid. My daughter-in-law sent us a text to thank us, and then she called, and she said, you know what I'm starting to figure out about this connection you and Rhett have? And I went, well, well I'm just, I just love him. And she goes, no, no, it's, 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 it's more than that. And I, I finally figured out what it is. You have this innate ability for several minutes every time you see him that everybody else in the world is just, everything stops. And you are 1,000% focused on this little boy. And he just loves it. Makes him feel safe. Makes him feel warm. Makes him feel like somebody cares, that he matters. I slow down. It's probably the only area in my life I slow down in. Patient people slow down. Let God move in them. Let God move through them. They slow down and make sure they aren't about their own agenda because they want to walk in sync with God. They want to walk in rhythm with the Holy Spirit. We've got to become more concerned about showing people we care versus telling them what we know. Showing people that we care versus telling them what we think. Showing people we care versus telling them what we stand for. Showing people we care versus telling them who we're going to vote for. Show them that you care. Slow down. Grow up. Be patient. Because God was and is and will continue to be so patient with us. I want to tell you something I'm learning about patience. It makes life better. And it makes us better at life. We're driving home from the airport. The worst place to be in St. Louis on Saturday. The airport. And we're driving home from the airport yesterday. And Becky looked over at me and she goes, Why, why are you crying? And I look back at her, and when I'm not crying, you're crying. We're both driving out of the airport crying. She goes, well, what, why are we crying? I go, man, I love those boys. And she goes, I, I do too. Maybe we should go back and just tell them we'll take them home. I'm like, I don't love them that much. Let them go home with their mom and dad. We're grandparents. We're not taking them home. They've been out of town for a week. Let them go home with their mom and dad. All the way home, Becky and I were like, oh, my gosh. Because we slow down. Patience is a virtue. It's a characteristic of Jesus. And Jesus doesn't invite us. He calls us to live this out. And patience is one of the greatest reflections of God's love that you and I can show. And we got to get better at this one. We got to get better at this one. Patience brings the temperature down. Patience brings our temperature down where conversations can be had. Patience lets somebody know, I care about you. I value you. I'm willing to slow down and, if necessary, come to a complete stop for you. Got to get better at this. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for this, as Kevin said earlier, the, this collection of, of writings and letters that these men and women wrote thousands of years ago by the inspiration of you and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for showing us in these writings things that help us to be better at life, to be better followers of you. And God, I pray that we could enlarge our capacity for patience by remembering how patient you have been with us. And God, I pray that this virtue, this characteristic, this attribute, this fruit of your spirit, patience, would begin to be lived out in our lives. God, I pray that, that, that people that come along and meet us 
that they might not believe how we believe. They might not like some things that we like. But God, I thank you that when they think of us, your followers, they'll think, man, those people were so patient and so kind. That must be what their God is like. Help us give that reflection, God. Help us lengthen that fuse for your sake, for the kingdom's sake. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.